and retaining long-term clients today. And myself, I'm Owen Lansbury, for those of you that haven't met me before. Um, I am a co-founder of Previous Next. I was MD of Previous Next for 10 years before handing over the reins to Jason Coughlin last year. Um, and a lot of my focus these days is going into uh, the Drupal South Steering Committee, and I've also just been appointed to the Global Drupal Association Board, so I've got a very heavy involvement in the community and its success. Um, and you, if you're sitting here, uh, you might be thinking of starting an agency yourself. Any hands up? No? You probably see, oh, you're not allowed to. <laughs> um, you might be running a smaller agency of your own uh, and be looking to, to grow that. You might work for a larger agency or organisation and be frustrated with client turnover and the chaos that generally comes with running projects. Um, but no matter who, who you are, I hope there is some takeaways from this talk. Um, now, I did deliver this talk in Amsterdam, so I've got a bit of a gardening theme going on, uh, the tulip capital of, of the world. But I think thinking about business in this way is, uh, is obviously much more interesting than having some click art uh, of people sitting in offices. Um, but it is about this notion of how do you seed clients, how do you nurture them and then grow them over, over time. Um, but before we get into that, what does make your business sustainable? It's kind of a, f a fundamental question. Um, and what things should you be focusing on to keep it sustainable? Um, so the first thing is, um, yes, we should all be doing work that we're interested in and working on things that we're passionate about. Um, but if you're a business owner or a, a business leader, ultimately you're responsible for your staff and the mortgages that they're paying and putting food on the table for their kids. Uh, and that's an immense responsibility. Um, but for myself, it's also the most rewarding thing. And I, I told my team the other day that my favourite part of Previous Next is the random channel where people are announcing their babies and their weddings and the houses that they're buying. Uh, and for me, that is by far the most rewarding thing about running a business. Um, but to achieve this, you're having a focus on the numbers that keep your business running is by far the most important thing that you can do as a, as a business leader. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is what's your capacity model? Um, and by that I mean as a services company, you're probably employing staff who work on a head hours basis for, for clients. And how are you fulfilling those head hours in, in terms of your capacity? So the example that I've used before is if you've got a five person agency, you as the founder, you're probably running around trying to get clients, doing payroll, um, marketing, working on strategy for clients, et cetera, et cetera, you're probably rarely going to be able to be more than about 30% billable yourself. Um, but then your team, you might have a designer, you might have three developers, and you should be aiming for 80% or above in terms of their billable capacity. Um, and I wrote a blog post last week uh, on the previous Next blog around how we manage that capacity model and billable model in terms of actually contributing code to Drupal as well in that other 20% time. So feel free to read that. Um, but if you are charging at kind of average rates and um, fulfilling about 6,000 hours of billable work a year, your five person agency should be doing about a million dollars in business uh, in terms of raw revenue. And then what's your profit model from that? Um, so out of that million dollars, you're probably spending 600,000 or so on wages. Uh, another 200,000 or so on operating costs, rent, flying people to Drupal South, et cetera, et cetera. And ideally, you should be aiming for around a 20% profit margin if you can achieve that, uh, which is going to leave you with about 200K. And uh, I think the important thing, especially in the context of the Drupal world, is profit shouldn't be a dirty word. It's your safety buffer from rough patches, uh, but also your freedom enabler. And if you do make profit, it's then up to you to decide what you actually do with it. So you might have a profit share scheme with your staff. Um, you might be uh, donating that to charities that you're passionate about, or you might be reinvesting that into both the Drupal community uh, and also into your own business. But I think in the meantime, with the example that we used of having a, a, a million dollar business with a five person agency, Unless you're doing more than a million dollars in business, you can't go off and hire someone new because that's just going to start cutting into your, uh, your profit model. And if you do consistently start dropping below that threshold of break even, 
Unfortunately, you have to do the hardest thing in running a business and probably let someone go. And by that um, action, it is definitely the hardest thing that you will do in running a business, but you need to make those decisions early enough to ensure that it's not the other four people that get affected by um, holding off too long on that. So I'm just gonna give you a run through of our own experience over the past decades. So in our first year, like uh, every new agency, we took on any project that we could uh, get our hands on. And at the end of that first year, we found that we had two clients that accounted for two thirds of our revenue. So that obviously creates a, a lot of risk in the business. If one of those clients dropped out, there's a third of our revenue gone and likely one of our employees. Um, and I think the other lesson that we found from that first year is that more than half of our clients were being billed under $10,000 each, but they still took up a significant amount of time in terms of managing them. Uh, and the classic example I always give is the client that we had that was paying the least amount of money was the one that was calling me up to ask me how to fix his iPhone at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> and of course, in that situation, you're going to say yes, you want to keep them happy, um, but ultimately that's just going to be eating into your time in terms of uh, servicing your other clients. And then we fast forward five years, we've got a nice little orchard starting to bloom. Uh, and we found that at the end of those five years, we had 20 clients that accounted for almost 90% of our revenue. So that's an amazing way to defray risk in your business if you've got that uh, volume of clients that are, are accounting for that proportion of revenue. But we still kept saying yes to small clients uh, and we still had almost 50 clients that were paying us under $10,000 a year at that point in time. And uh, while that sounds like a big number in aggregate, the amount of effort that you have to go through to service that many clients is uh, incredibly complex and, and time consuming. And then we just ticked over 10 years uh, earlier this year. And what we did a few years ago was we looked at our, um, our clients on our uh, roster and looked at the ones that were really just ticking along at that low billable rate. <clears throat> and we retired most of them, if not all of them. Um, and we did that by referring them onto smaller agencies. We had one agency take off, uh, I think about 20 of our small hosting clients and um, incorporate them into their own platform. And that's a good outcome for everyone. They're off our hands as a company. We're not servicing those clients as well as we should be anyway. They're now working with people that are really enthused about working with them. Um, and everyone understands why that needs to happen. Um, so. In terms of where we're currently at, we've got 10 clients that account for about 80% of our revenue. Uh, and I think the important thing is that we've only got about 30 clients in total, and only a small number of those are being billed under about $20,000 a year. Um, and I think importantly for us, we've really focused on how do we uh, build in retained uh, uh, revenue from those clients, and we're now almost at 50% of our revenue is paid upfront at the beginning of the year, and then we burn down that um, throughout the course of the year. Um, as a company, we're fiercely independent. <laughs> we've uh, stayed consciously at around 20 staff. We've resisted the urge to grow for the sake of growth. Um, and I think the, the lesson that I've had from many people is you might grow to 50 or 70 people, but your profit margins get massively eroded as a, a, a small company and the challenge of maintaining that type of pipeline of work is uh, extraordinary. Um, some people can do it and have been very successful at it. We've chosen not to go down that path at this point in time. Don't say it won't ever happen though. <laughs> um, so as we get into the kind of guts of uh, the, the talk, I wanna go back to that notion of seeding your business with clients. And before you do that, you really need to define who your ideal clients are. Um, there's a common saying is that your clients define you, um, but you do need to be proactive as early as possible about saying, we're really good at this, we're really interested in these types of things, let's identify the types of clients that we wanna go after and work out how to, uh, how to find them. Um, so a wise person once said to me, uh, a mentor that we had in our business for quite a long time, that you should always be thinking of the first project is about 10% of what you might bill over time uh, with a client. 
And this is a great lens through which to view opportunities with new clients, i.e., can you foresee billing another 90% on top of what you've originally billed in terms of ongoing projects that you might have with them? And that doesn't mean that you turn clients down that uh, don't fit this model, uh, but it's a great I way to identify the, the really golden clients that um, I, you are going to have those long-term relationships with. And one way of uh, looking at long-term clients is what attributes do they share? Um, so when you're starting to talk to a client, do they tick things off like, do they have really complex needs? Um, that's a, a sure signifier that they're going to need a lot of your services. Um, do they have multiple divisions within their own organisation um, that are working on lots of different things at once? Um, do they have their own large internal team? So they might already have Drupal developers in-house in and working on existing platforms, um, but do they need those teams to be augmented or um, assisted from a, a kind of uh, higher expertise perspective? Um, do they have ambitious targets? So do they have ambitious sales targets? Are they looking to secure new customers? Do they have new products that they're continu continually rolling out? Um, and I think what this all leads to is that these types of clients, they have significant technology budgets. Um, and it's quite easy to find out uh, what, what type of budgets they're usually dealing with, but they're usually in the, the millions of dollars. Um, and as I said before, we put a lot of focus into identifying what types of clients are going to need retainer-based services. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so unless you enjoy herding cats, Upselling to these types of clients is always going to be far easier than establishing an entirely new client relationship. Um, and the effort to extract revenue from a few big clients is far easier than lots and lots of smaller ones. And a great example is what's going to be easier? Doing two projects worth $500,000 each with two teams that you're dealing with, um, or 50 projects worth $20,000? And there's an obvious answer there. So one of the things that we do when we're uh, starting to talk to a new client is going through a client qualification checklist. Um, and this is about paying close attention to how well a new client uh, fits your preferred model before you even start talking to them or pursuing them. Um, and it's as much about you identifying that you want to work with the client as the client identifying that they want to work with you. Um, and so the method that we use is just a simple checklist. We don't even refer to the table anymore. It's just in the back of our heads all the time. But what's the st strategic opportunity of working with this client? Is it going to complement our existing client base? Um, is it complementing an existing vertical that we work with? Are we moving into a new vertical that we want to work within? Um, does it help us disable a competitor if we win this project? Um, what type of program of work are they likely to have over time? Is there going to be more projects past the first one? Will they need managed services? Will they need us to continually improve their, their platforms for them? Do they have an internal team that we, uh, we can augment? And then what's our likelihood of actually winning this thing? Have they gone out to tender and there's 50 respondents and we've got a less than 5% chance of, of winning that in the first place? Have they identified Drupal as their preferred CMS upfront um, or open source in general? Or are they going out to market for a general CMS showdown tender? And you're actually having to sell Drupal before you sell your own company. Um, and what's really important for us is what's our rapport with this client early on? What kind of cues are we picking up from them in terms of the relationship we're likely to have with them? Um, are they being obstinate and dictatorial with us from the word go? Or are they approaching this as looking for a partner that's going to share their same goals for delivering the project? Um, budget's obviously important. And the first question I always ask a potential new client is, what's your budget? <laughs> and many of them will say, oh, I can't tell you that. Um, but the ones that do say, well, we've got this amount to spend. This is what we're expecting. That's the best way that you can start a client relationship, because then you can say, well, for that type of money, we expect that we'd be able to deliver these types of things because we're going to deliver what we can in terms of value within your expectations. Is the budget realistic? Most likely not <laughs> in many cases. But again, it's that conversation early on to set their expectations around what realistic actually looks like. Uh, and then finally, what's our resourcing uh, capacity to actually take this on? And this is the classic trap that small agencies fall into. Yay, we've got a big new client, but we've got no people to deliver it. 
you go through a mad scramble to hire as many people as you can, they're not going to be working uh, at full capacity from day one. So one of the approaches that we've taken, which has just been instilled for the last few years and which Fonda is a key part of, is uh, looking at our resource capacity over the course of the next quarter or next two quarters, looking at this new project that's coming in and saying, where could we fit this in? And being open with the client about that as early as possible to say, well, we're backed up until um, March next year. If you want to work with us, that's when you're going to have to wait until. Um, and obviously, that's not something that is going to be applicable every time. But again, having that conversation early is really key in terms of setting expectations, building trust, and building good rapport. Um, so now you've defined the types of clients you want to work with, how do you win them? So I think the important thing to understand is where you fit into a client's <laughs> purchase cycle. Um, so large organisations, uh, they're often going to engage a separate firm to do their digital strategy or they might manage that internally. Um, many of these big firms still view UX and design as separate activities that they might go off and get another firm to do before they even st start thinking about the technology. Um, and like I said before, many of them are um, going to these CMS showdown, which CMS should we, we choose? Um, and we try and avoid that where possible because it's just this enormous time suck and we've uh, potentially got a low, low chance of winning in those situations. So it's always preferable that they've specified Drupal in their RFQs. Um, and I think the, the challenge for us as Drupal services companies is many of these big clients come to you as the implementer. Um, and that's challenging because they've already made a lot of strategic decisions about the project uh, very early on. They're coming to you saying, this is what our website's going to look like. Here's all the features. We know nothing about Drupal. <laughs> now we want you to fit this uh, square peg into a round hole. So what we do try and do uh, with new opportunities to, is to try and get ourselves as high up that purchase cycle as possible in terms of decision-making influence. Um, and ideally ensure that they understand uh, how Drupal can fit what they're trying to achieve as early as possible. So now we're getting into a bit of marketing stuff. How are these types of clients going to find you? You're this little agency, you've got a, a limited profile in a particular sector. Um, and so the things that we've really focused on are um, what is your own profile within that industry sector? So if you're familiar with previous Next, we tend to do large public sector projects. We're really good at doing that. I think we've currently got about five or six universities on our client roster. Another university comes to us because they, they're aware that we've got that expertise. Um, what's our profile within the Drupal community? So um, many of you would be aware that we put a lot of effort into ensuring that that stays strong through our contribution. Um, and that's vitally important to our clients in terms of understanding our, our commitment and capability. Um, content marketing and SEO that comes from that's really key for us as well. So you'll see our team constantly blogging about either very detailed technical things or quite high level concepts. Um, and they're not specifically designed to capture SEO terms, but if someone's searching for how do I integrate such and such video platform with Drupal, there's a good likelihood that we might have written a, a blog post about that. Um, expert marketing i.e. talking at conferences, is really key for us. Um, it demonstrates expertise that we're sharing with the community. Um, and then as we start working down to more traditional um, methods, personal referrals are key for us. So if we've built good rapport with the client, they're going to be telling their colleagues that might work for competing companies and organisations, hey, I've been working with these guys. They're awesome. You should work with them too. And um, there's no amount of, of value that can actually be put on, on that. That's still how people do business these days. And then the things that we find are relatively ineffective are, I suppose, what you call business networking events, where you're trying to run around and shake people's hands and, hey, would you like to buy a website? That really doesn't work for us. It may work for other people. And cold calling. We've never made a cold call, <laughs> ever. <laughs> if you resorting to cold calling, your business will probably go out of business very quickly. Um, so why would clients choose you once they've got a sense of who you are? Again, it goes back to your company profile. And I think the key thing with these bigger organisations and really any organisation is they want to be telling their colleagues and their bosses that they've chosen the best possible company to deliver on their project. Um, and there's a high level of prestige uh, around that in terms of clients themselves. 
Um, and I think one of the, the big learnings that we've had is to demonstrate very early on that we understand a client's needs. It's very easy to rest on your laurels and say, oh, we're one of the biggest Drupal contributors and blah, blah, blah. They do not give a shit unless you can demonstrate how that translates into understanding their needs, um, they're unlikely to have a second conversation with you. So any RFP <clears throat> really put that effort into uh, uh, demonstrating how you do understand their goals and needs, and that's definitely a hard lesson that we've, we've learned. Um, demonstrating relevant and demonstrable expertise is, is obviously key. So what examples do you have of things that you've done like what they want to do in the past? Um, again, personal impressions and initial relationships that you have with these clients, it's not about whining and dining with them, it's about understanding can you sit in a room with these people for months on end and have fun working on a project with them. And if you can't have that rapport early on, that's a really big red flag. Uh, and at the very bottom of that list is price. So a client will almost never choose you solely based on price. It does happen. It usually backfires for them, and they usually come back to you at the end of the day anyway. Um, and I think in terms of you thinking about setting your own rates, uh, that should be set in terms of what you understand the market's willing to pay and your perception of expertise uh, in terms of that market. Um, we have really rarely um, compromised on price, uh, especially early on in a project. If a client comes back to us and says, that's way too much, our first question will be, well, what do you want to cut out? And many times we don't win those projects, but again, it's that indicator of uh, what your relationship's going to be like with them. So what types of clients can you work with that kind of fit these long-term client um, characteristics? So I think we all have uh, aspirations or pretensions to want to work with these big global brands. So, hey, we worked on the Coca-Cola website or, or, or whatever. Um, I think the reality for independent firms is those relationships are locked up by big global digital agencies, decisions being made about technology choices, etc., cetera, uh, being made in New York and London and wherever else. They're not being made in Sydney or Hobart or, or wherever. So um, I think it's very, very hard to establish a relationship with those types of clients that are at a local level. Um, and I think, sure, there's going to be partnering opportunities. We've often had these big digital agencies call us up and say, quick, we need help with Drupal. And uh, sure, they might use you on an initial project if they can see that there's a long-term uh, future for them in having Drupal services. They're going to internalize that pretty quickly. They might buy you to do that, but um, uh, they're not going to give you that relationship. Um, and I think that's the key with uh, working with these types of big global brands is that you'll never own the relationship as a small independent firm. You're always going to be two or three tiers down the, the food chain. Um, and that doesn't translate into repeat long-term relationships. Um, but what we have found success with is challenger brands. So you've got, uh, say, a, a vertical market like telecommunications. You've got the big players like the Optus and the Telstras, but then you've got all these upstart players. Um, and they're much more willing to engage independent agencies, A, to kind of keep their costs down. They want to work with smaller teams and innovate faster. They're open to using new technologies to help them do that. Um, and a great example for us is Amazim, which you might be familiar with, came to us when they were relatively small. I think they'd just gone public. Um, really didn't have much in terms of a platform, standardised on Drupal 8. I think it was the first big Drupal 8 project that we built. And uh, now they've got well in excess of a million customers. So we've grown with them and they've remained loyal to us throughout that, that, that process. Um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work in public sector, but it is a great way for smaller agencies to um, get a toehold into that market. Um, government does have policies around using local firms over big international ones. Um, they, especially in Australia and New Zealand, have uh, policies around the use of open source. And we've seen the results of that with things like GovCMS, where Drupal has been able to es establish a, a, um, a very firm foothold in that sector. Um, all of these uh, public sector clients will have panels that you can apply to be on. Uh, and that's a lot of paperwork to go through but you've just got to suck it up, get through that paperwork. Once you've been approved on those types of panels, uh, 
you rarely actually fall off them. Um, so once you're on, you're on, and you can then be applying for, for these projects uh, that do come up. And uh, the tender process for dealing with these types of clients, again, can be incredibly frustrating and arcane and ticking all every box that they have in terms of um, compliance and that type of thing. But they'll also generally be more transparent in terms of if you didn't win, uh, they're more or less obligated to tell you specifically why. Uh, and I definitely encourage you, every project that you never win, always talk to the client about why you didn't win and use that for self-improvement. And we've learned a huge amount by having those conversations with clients that we didn't win. But you did win. So now what? <laughs> so I think the, uh, the thing that we do when we first win a client is uh, essentially put up a big fence and set some parameters around how we're going to work together. So early on, we had a thing called a project charter that had a whole range of uh, detail around who we are as a team, who's going on maternity leave through the project, uh, what people's responsibilities are on our side, but equally, what are the client's responsibilities? Who on their side needs to turn up to scrum meetings every day? Um, who on their side is the decision maker? What time do we need decisions to be made in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think having that conversation at the very beginning of a project with the client, everyone's clear on how you've agreed to work together. And if you want to sign that in a document, that's great. That's probably not legally binding, but, um, but it does set this expectation of this is how we're going to work together. Um, the other component here is have the right people having those conversations and managing those relationships. So one of my big learnings as a, a co-founder is I'm not the right person to have those conversations. Fonda is. <laughs> and uh, I think identifying that at the appropriate time and delegating that responsibility to someone that does have those skills is really key to your success as a business. And, and without people like Fonda and her team, um, we definitely wouldn't be in the position that we are. And Getting back to this relationship notion, um, treat your partners as clients and try and make sure that they're treating you the same way. So I think having this notion of partnership as opposed to this client vendor power relationship is really key to um, a successful long-term relationship. And the first project that you do with a client is always gonna be the test of, of that um, in terms of working together. Um, and I think one of the, the key things is a client is always going to be coming to you saying, well, we want you to do things this way. And the conversation at that point is, well, you chose us because we said we're going to do it this way, whether it's agile or waterfall or, or, or whatever. And if you start compromising your own processes too much early on, that's always going to backfire. And um, that, that relationship is likely to go sour very quickly. So getting this right early on really sets the tone of that, that long-term relationship you're likely to have. And then this notion of value add wherever possible. So um, like I said early on, demonstrate that you understand what their goals are in the proposal process, but keep demonstrating that through your engagement with them um, because you're showing that you understand what they're trying to achieve and what their goals are. And that should be the whole team that's working on the project that's uh, demonstrating that they understand it, not just the, the project managers. So, um, the way that we structure our teams is very open in terms of communication. Everyone's aware of what the client's trying to achieve, and that's instilled um, from the most junior developer through to the project lead. Um, I think one of the traps that we can fall into as small agencies as well as be really precious about our ideas, and the things I always like to say is ideas are easy, it's the implementation that's hard, and hopefully your client that you've given that ID to is going to uh, engage you to deliver on that idea. Um, and then finally on that, uh, like I said, in terms of partnership, you do need to work collaboratively. You don't want to have this us and them uh, attitude and you really need to nip that in the bud uh, as, as quickly as possible because ultimately you're all wanting to be working towards the success of the project and then subsequent projects that you're going to be working on. But through all of this, there's going to be chaos. And I think working with large organisations, they're always in flux. There's always new managers, there's restructured teams, there's revised strategies. It's the classic thing of there's a new CMO or CTO comes in and says, what are you doing on this project? 
Um, and I think the important thing for you is that you're often working on their most important public facing outlet um, and you're essentially keeping the lights on for their business. So you need to be ensuring that uh, they're reminded of that on a regular occasion, but also taking this Zen attitude of you're going to ride out those bumps. Um, and I think the, the classic scenario is many of our clients we've been working with for five, six, seven years, we've seen tens of different people in their teams and managers that have come and gone. We're still there. We're keeping keeping the lights on and we are viewed as being indispensable by their senior management in terms of the success of their business. Um, as I mentioned before, looking for that repeat revenue that you can be getting with clients. So um, where we do discount is if a client says we need X volume of hours from you on a monthly basis, sure, we're going to give them a, a little discount to thank them for that. Um, and they're going to pay for that upfront ideally annually. So with many of our clients, they've said we need 20 or 40 or however many hours a month. They pay for that upfront at the beginning of the year and then we burn down. Um, and we've obviously got processes on a, on a repeat basis around identifying what they need us to use those hours for and ensuring that we're delivering that for them. And I think the important thing about that is that for you as a business, you've got the cash in hand. It gives you incredible stability uh, in terms of managing your own business, but it also provides your clients with um, strong certainty. They're going to be working with a consistent team across the course of the year. Um, they've got good relationships with that team and uh, they know what your capabilities in terms of delivering. And a big part of that is support and hosting. So many of us as small agencies go, oh, that's all too complicated. Um, I can outsource that to a third party. As soon as you introduce that third party to a client, you've fractured that relationship. So the lesson that we learnt the hard way is that you do need to manage that relationship um, yourself. Don't hand that over to a third party for them to have a direct relationship with the client and just white label those services if you need to. And at a certain point, you might be able to deliver those services yourself. And as you might have seen uh, before the keynote yesterday, we've launched our own little hosting platform that's come out of years of us um, having that expertise in-house, and now we're confident to do it ourselves. Um, but I think the important thing is, if you don't dilute that relationship, it does establish you as the owner of everything that they're doing with Drupal, and they're always going to be coming to you in terms of decisions they're making, not to a third party. But none of this is without hiccups. Hiccups are always going to happen, and I think your relationships with the client are the things that uh, helps you ride out those rough patches. So your key contacts within a large organization, they're also your biggest li liability. If they move on and a new person comes in, like I said, the classic new CMO, they've worked with another team in the past, they're gonna come in, wanna shake things up, show that they're making progress in their own role. That's a huge risk for you as a, as a small agency. So I think what we've tried to do is buffer this by ensuring that we've got multi-tiered relationships within an organization so that we're not just relying on Fonda talking to her um, compatriot on the client side at a, a project level. We've got Jason in there talking to their CMO or their CTO or their CEO, ideally. Um, and having that multi-tiered relationship means that if one key person does leave, you've still got these relationships higher up the chain and those are the people that are ultimately signing the checks at the end of the day, and they understand the value that you've delivered. Um, nothing's perfect. There will be hiccups in, in that process. Um, but I think uh, clients will always be prepared to accept hiccups and mistakes that you might have made if you've got that strength of relationship and they ultimately trust you anyway. And I think another big risk is that your own team's going to change over time. So, um, people will just tire working on the same project for year after year and we've definitely had to deal with that situation. Um, the issue f in that case is the clients have got very attached to that person and one of our classic scenarios was we had our key project manager um, move on and our key client was like, what? She can't leave? <laughs> And so having a very strong process around that change management from our side as our team changes is, is critical um, and involve your own clients in that conversation. Hey, our key person is 
moving on, they're having a baby, they're going traveling, whatever, moving state, moving country. Have that conversation with your client early on, get them involved in the process in terms of identifying what their needs are for that role, informing your hiring process. There might be someone else within your organization that's gonna move into that role, or you're gonna hire someone externally, but you need to have that, that conversation. The other risk is the big vendors are here. I look at that as a risk and an opportunity. So we do have some, um, some big attention from the big four now, um, Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, EY. They're all in the Drupal space. That's a great validation of the technology that we're using. They can see the value of Drupal in delivering massive projects. Um, but I think the, the risk for us as independents is they've probably already got relationships in some form with these big clients that you're working with. They might do their accounting systems or CRM systems or, or whatever, and they can see an opportunity to expand their, their footprint. And really the only uh, defense that you have against that type of encroachment into your clients is to continually be de demonstrating value and the strength of your relationships uh, in that case. Um, and sometimes you might win, sometimes you might lose in that situation. And then the final challenge I want to talk about is clients might want to bring their skills in-house. Hey, we're using heaps of Drupal. We should hire our own Drupal developers. And uh, I think the, the classic catch is, oh, no, they're going to drop us completely. But um, what we've learned is that we need to work cooperatively with our clients through that process, um, ensure that you've got clear parameters around how your team's working with their team. Again, going back to this notion of a project charter of if someone of the client team releases code, are we reviewing that code um, or are they releasing it unchecked? And if something does go wrong, what are the processes around that? Um, and in many cases, those internal teams will become quite capable, but in most cases, they're only really gonna be capable of uh, maintaining businesses as usual, and they'll be coming back to you for the heavy lifting and for any kind of big new projects that they're wanting to, to work on. And as I've mentioned before, if you've got these long-term relationships with clients, their initiative to build an in-house team, it might run for two years, they might lose a couple of key developers, then they might go, that's all too hard, let's get you back up to full speed again. So don't burn the bridges, be kind of sitting there in the, in the background. And then finally, everything has a shelf life. So while you might work with a client over a very long period of time, there might be a natural end to that relationship at some point. Um, but I think the, the message here is that you want to be careful about complacency with your long-term clients if you've been working with them for a number of years. And it goes back to that notion of always demonstrating value. Um, but often, sometimes things are way out of your control. They've made a decision at a head office level globally to change technologies. Drupal's now no longer part of that mix. Uh, and you're, they're going to move on from you. So I'm going to wrap up five takeaways to uh, go home with. Um, number one, know what your capacity is and what you should be uh, billing as an agency. Number two, actively define the types of clients um, you want to work with and win them. Number three, establish a structured multi-tier relationship with your key clients. That's going to help you write out the rough patches. Uh, number four, retire small clients in favour of larger long-term engagements and retain a base fees if you're in a position to do so. And then finally, approach your long-term clients as if each project is your first one. So I'm going to leave it there. I think we're just on time. I've got about six minutes for questions, I think. Ask me anything. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Owen. That was a great talk. Um, um, I was going to ask, um, in terms of uh, quite often when you're dealing with an RFQ uh, or RF, RFP, you're dealing with a communications advisor or a project manager, um, how hard do you work on um, building re relationships up the management um, chain and, and what is the timing of that? That's a complete case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> so uh, many public sector RFQs, they're going to be managed by a coordinator that's got no understanding of what the project's about and what the technology is. Um, and they won't let you speak to anyone within their organisation. They just want to have the document back from you and that's that. Um, we view that as often a bit of a warning sign and we really want to win the project if we're going to respond to those types of tenders if we can't have a conversation early. Um, so I think the, to answer your question, uh, 
look for an opportunity to start having conversations with them. And that might be as simple as, we just want to have a conversation with your team to ensure that we're clear on what your uh, expectations around functionality are, something like that. Um, the other thing that we'll often do is run an initial discovery workshop. Um, so if a client's open to doing that, having uh, something like that as a, a pre-sales activity with them. Um, but it's essentially any opportunity that you can be starting to talk to the people who are really going to be making the decisions is, is key. Just blindly answering RFQs is, is often uh, are, are just throwing things down a black hole. Other questions? With your client qualification checklist, how many of these boxes do you feel like need to be ticked in order for it to, for you to proceed? Is it like 80% or how do you go about that? It's all managed from here. Ah. <laughs> so like I said, we initially put that checklist together as these are the things that are important to us, but now it's kind of second nature of, do they tick these boxes? Um, is there something that really outweighs another factor that's going to make us either go for that project or not go for it? So again, ultimately, it does come down to gut feel of, yes, we think we can win this project. Yes, it lines up with what we're trying to do as a company. Yes, we can see it's a long-term prospect. And then we go all in. And that's often a conversation amongst the team. So um, we actually have a, a leadership team that oversees which um, proposals we go for and they're the ones that make the decision as to whether we actually go for them. More questions? Owen, oh, the transparency in your presentation is awesome, and so thank you for that. That um, can relate to a lot of the pain and, the, yep. and, and all that's great. The, the question I have is that, that the point you made earlier around there's an opportunity that comes, you look at your capacity, um, you don't have it immediately, they want to start yep. that, that tension between you know, risking losing because they can't wait yep. versus the how do we cobble together the resources to make it work and what, the, mm. that process you go through. Yeah, so um, I think the way that we've tried to deal with that is, is this an opportunity that's going to take us as a company up to the next level? Um, and as I said early on, we've been very comfortable as a company of 20 people um, for at least six or seven or eight years. Uh, and sure, we've had moments we've kind of bumped up above that from time to time, but if we we're going to really go for something that's going to take us up to, say, 30 people, we'd need to be very confident that we can maintain that capacity in the long term. Um, and we actually had exactly that situation when Fonda joined us. We won a big government project that was um, substantial to hire a dedicated team for. Um, we bought Fonda in on a contract that said, once this project's finished, we have a right to terminate your contract. Sorry, Fonda. <laughs> um, but once we were clear that we'd got through um, the first stages of that project and that we're going to be able to maintain things uh, at that scale long term, then we gave you a permanent contract, didn't we? <laughs> So there's little methods that you can use there so that you're not putting all your, your eggs into one basket, um, that you're clear with the team that's coming on board. You're specifically engaged for this project. If it terminates for whatever reason, us as a company aren't lumped with carrying you. Um, and I think the other component of that is that you can use those opportunities to really take your business up to the next level as long as you've got the processes in place to maintain that pipeline. And that's the tough part, <laughs> as you would know. <laughs> Greg? I've got a couple of questions. Just, well, sorry, one last question was two. First one is, have you, you were talking about hourly pricing to work out your profitability. Yep. I always think that's such a dangerous thing because we have people work in our organisation who are worth, produce three times, four times, yep. five times <coughs> in an hour. Uh, we use a blended hourly rate, which yep. always seems bizarre to me because we should we be looking too. at a yep. value pricing model. Have you looked yep. at that? The second question, if I can just throw it in, is a really quick one. When you decided to cut off at your cutoff point and get rid of your smaller clients, yep. did you consider setting up a second brand, a low cost brand with a low? <coughs> no. <coughs> so the first question is, <laughs> two questions. The first one is, uh, you've got a whole bunch of people of different skills in your team. How do you price them out? And as Greg alluded to, we found the simplest thing is that you have a blended rate. 
that reflects someone might be worth $300 an hour, another person might be worth 150 and so you kind of reach a happy medium there. That makes so, things so much simpler in terms of billing as well, so you've got a kind of blended rate there. Um, and then I think from our own perspective, our model of, of hiring is uh, we do want to get the best people who are working at the highest capacity and um, the team essentially self-selects out. If we bring someone new in that just doesn't come up to the level of the rest of the team, that person is often identified as someone that can get a better job somewhere else. <laughs> and the, it's the team that identifies that because everyone's kind of working together. Um, so I think we've been very lucky in terms of uh, having a team that does all work at a, a pretty similar capacity. Second part of the question was uh, retiring smaller clients or set, setting up a small second brand. If you like dealing with little 10 to 20K projects with heaps of different clients that are all just as demanding as the big ones, great. But it's not our model yet. And I think for us, um, it was a great way to pass on work to other companies. Um, we've passed them. I think Murray, you've yeah. taken a couple of clients from us in the past, have you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alex, last question. Yes. Uh, how would oh. you see strategic value to maintain a small business unit that operates somewhat in tandem but separately from enterprise units in order to sort of train uh, new dribblers and bring in new juniors and sort of bring them through that? I'm sorry, even if they're not necessarily profitable, yep. um, is there other benefit to doing that? Or what have you done with that profitable? Uh, so the question was whether we would have a unit that's working with smaller clients as a way of training people up. Um, ultimately, we want to be working with these big clients and we want people that are capable of working on them and so they need to really have that experience early on. Um, working with juniors is, is, is really challenging for us because we do have a, a team that's working at a high capacity. So um, I think one of the models that we have used is hire a few juniors um, and that's essentially a war of attrition in terms of who maintains their position long term. Um, and like I said, as a small business, you need to make those decisions early on around who's the best fit and who might not be the best fit or just in terms of, of revenue. Um, and again, a mistake that we've often made is we've just let that drag on too long and by the time you actually make the decision, it causes a lot more harm than it might have otherwise. Um, so I'm around the conference if you want to have a chat about anything um, feel free to grab me and uh, thank you for